this morning has been filled with such great speakers and such wonderful facts and numbers. And I feel like I'm taking it up a level in that I don't have all that great detail. So I'm hoping that you are satiated by detail because I'll be talking about ideas mostly and not the numbers. So uh, a new e economic model built by the people powered by technology. I see a future where I'm in a lot of policy meetings and we keep talking about what government can do and what business can do, and by that we mean big business. And I'm very interested and I see a very large rise in a third sector we don't seem to talk about, people. Well, how can people help solve these problems themselves? And I think we have a lot of new tools that are bringing this. So as I say, I'm giving you, I think this is a significant new trend and I'll be giving examples of that, but I want to say I don't think the world will end up having no governments and no big businesses. There's still a significant role for them, but I'm hoping to add a new thought to your process, to thinking. Uh, so I feel like some of you know these things and others of you, perhaps this is new ideas. So what are the implications of urbanization on cars? As people move into cities, what happens is we know that the cost of ownership is increasing. We have increasing costs of fossil fuel, parking, toll roads, congestion pricing, carbon taxes. So we know the cost of driving and operating a car is only going up, and particularly when we move into these dense urban areas. Meantime, when we're in these dense urban areas, the benefits of car ownership are decreasing. So because I can't get places, I now start to um, use other modes of transportation. Congestion is slowing the pace. I would rather go, as I say, in other methods. So my ROI per trip in the car is diminishing. I was just at another, uh, another conference yesterday, and we were talking about the costs of transit. When people are thinking about building transit infrastructure, they keep looking at what's the cost per trip. I think the same thing can be said of car ownership. What is the cost per trip? What is the value you're getting out of it? And when people are living in dense urban areas, that cost per trip becomes really significant. What is unappreciated is that today car manufacturers are only selling cars in one bite. I have to own it, that's it. I own it or I have no access. And I think this is what we see technology is enabling in the future and what we found when we do car sharing. Car sharing says you can have that car, but you don't have to buy the entire thing. You pay for it as you use it. So it really can, can satisfy your demand for mobility and status. Um, when I launched Zipcar in the United States, everyone was quick to tell me, and I'm very amused, I get the exact same words when I'm in France. They said, oh, but you don't understand, in the US, we love our cars, and our ego is identified with cars, and I get status from my car. Car sharing will never work. What we see is that's not the case. And when I'm in France, everyone tells me the same thing. So I think we see a whole segment of the population that is smarter than that, where economics comes into play. So to finish this slide, um, I do think car sharing is an enormous piece of the future, and I think a lot about transitions and getting from where we are today to this future that we are hoping to achieve by 2030 and by 2050. And when we think of these dense, dense urbaniz urbanized areas, we can predict that we cannot have the car consumption that we have today. We see that already. And car sharing is going to be that path from how we go from where we are today to this future with perhaps some car use for the right trip, and it will sat satisfy that. So therefore, we know that car governments and companies are, are excited about this option of car sharing because we can satisfy car demand with the least physical space in terms of parking and the least CO2 emissions, which I'll talk about now, why car sharing brings down CO2 emissions. So here is the company that I founded, Zipcar, and right now it's 11 years old. And in those 11 years, 605,000 people are now sharing 9,000 cars. So 605,000 people are car satisfied with 9,000 cars. Those people and those cars are parked throughout major metropolitan areas in the US, a few Canadian cities, 250 university towns in the United States, as well as in the UK. So they are in this place where we used to think that people only wanted to own their own car. What we find, which is really very nice with, the, so the question is why? 
<laughs> why? Why are these people interested and why are they signing up and why did they decide it was something worthwhile for them? Because of this idea that you pay only for what you use. In the United States, the average cost of owning and operating a car for a year is $8,000 a year. In France, it's 6,000 euros a year, which means that every single day I'm in my car, every single day I own my car, whether or not I'm using it, I'm spending 25 US dollars a day or 18 euros a day. That's a lot of money when I'm not using it to go to work. Now, that's so much money that's just passing that I'm not, I'm not getting that benefit as we discussed. I'm often in conversations where people are talking about what's the perfect car of the future? I'm hugely amused by that question because people keep thinking that, tell me, Robin, I want to design the perfect car. How does it look like? When you're doing car sharing, I don't have to have just one. My perfect car is the car that matches my exact trip that I'm going on. Am I traveling by myself? Do I have my mother who is in a wheelchair? Am I carrying heavy loads? Am I trying to impress my boss? Am I going to buy lumber? I get the car that fits the exact trip that I need. And so what is the perfect car of the future? It is a shared car. <laughs> Finish. That's, that is the answer to that question. It is big. It is small. It is cheap, it is expensive, it is fancy, it is old and used up because I'm taking my 10 dogs. Every single, car, every single trip is the right car. No maintenance. We keep talking about will this be acceptable in low-income countries? It, does it satisfy my, my future? Absolutely, because this is the highest form of car ownership. You poor person, you only have one car. You have to have to drive your Mercedes every day of the week. Sorry for you, I'm way clever. I have a different car for every trip. I never maintain it, someone else's problem. I don't have to worry about parking, someone else deals with that. This is the highest form of, highest status of car ownership. And lastly, this idea of an entire fleet at your fingertips. When we started Zipcar, I think I personally ill appreciated the idea of uh, what it was to have an entire fleet. So today, when I go to the United States, as a Zipcar member, I did a trip, uh, a lecture trip, and I gave talks, oh, sorry. <laughs> I gave talks in Washington, New York, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and DC, and next to my hotel, there was a Zipcar within 100 yards. I had, within 30 seconds, access to a car in every one of those cities, had I wanted it. When I have my own car, I don't have that kind of access. So the idea of changing the way we conceptualize cars, I really want to emphasize, is not something negative going backward. It is the future. It is a vastly better future. And I think that when we go down the economic standpoint, it is really, um, I, I believe that marketing is everything. I'm hoping I just convinced you. And I think that this marketing can happen on a very large scale. So if we go back to Zipcar's example, what has happened in those 11 years? There's the 600,000 people driving 9,000 cars parked in 9,000 parking spaces, and each one of those people drives less per year on average. Even those who had no car, who are now driving more, if we take those people and we match them with the percent of people who sell their cars because they joined the service, which is 40% of them, we find that on average they drive less. Why? It wasn't because they're driving electric vehicles, it wasn't because they're driving CND vehicles, it was because the costs are 100% variable. When I have to pay by the hour and by the day, I don't go buy that ice cream because I'm feeling hot and want something sweet. I don't do that anymore. I, um, each time I use the car, it is rationally, financially rationally the right choice among my transportation options. And by that, people reduce their trips by 40 to 80 percent. 40 to 80 percent of the kilometers traveled is reduced when we pay fully variably. So for me, if I think of a policy standpoint, to maximize the likelihood, to maximize the variable costs of car ownership is my number one priority because that reduces immediately demand for miles traveled by 40 to 80 percent. So again, I see, I see this marketing attribute an economic attribute and a social policy attribute to moving to car sharing. So what is the result for Zipcar? What has Zipcar today done? There are 135,000 135, fewer cars bought, which I was talking to someone from GM, was in 2010 was half a percent of the US car market was not bought because of Zipcars, a lot. 400,000 parking spaces did not need to be built or could be repurposed because every car on the street requires three spaces. 
home, work, and retail. And I can tell you that in places where, uh, in, in Boston where we launched, MIT has absolutely not had to build one parking garage thanks to the existence of Zipcar. So it's a lot of money that's put on the table. The end result is 1.16 million metric tons of CO2 in 2010 that were not put in the atmosphere because people were driving fewer miles. So for me, and which is why this is my work, this is a very fast, low cost, low infrastructure cost uh, way of getting at our needs around congestion, CO2 emissions, and improved livability of cities. But I want to tell you, I've just sold to you why I think Zipcar was a fabulous thing, but in fact, it is not such a fabulous thing because there's a new movement afoot, and this is what I want to talk to you about today. So if you look at these companies, they are big. Everyone's talked about them for a long time, a long time as in the last 10 years. I do a lot of, uh, I, I attend and know a lot of people in the technology and internet sphere. You know, five years ago, everyone was talking about, wow, Google, Facebook, YouTube, how did it happen? What was going on? I want to give you a different way to look at those companies and their success. Google is the result of my searches and my links. Google is using my searches and my links to tell you what is the right, when you type in these three words, where do you want to go? And it's thanks to all of us, our contributions, that they are successful. Facebook is built on my friends and my photos and my gossip. That's why Facebook is working. YouTube, it's my videos. If you compare YouTube to television channel production, think of the cost to YouTube to producing itself versus regular television channels. More and more of these. Wikipedia, it's my knowledge, and that's the reason why we've been able to do a world's encyclopedia in 10 years. eBay, huge, my stuff is being sold. Flickr, my photos. So what is going on here? These are people empowered. People are creating and adding onto a specific platform. All of us just spent last night in a place like this. Hotels, hotels are bed sharing. I want to talk to you about what is the largest hotels in the world. The largest is the Intercontinental Hotel Group. And in 60 years, they have 645,000 beds in 100 countries. So just think of what that took. There's some people here who work in car manufacturing. Think of the effort and the investment and the cost and the planning to build the Intercontinental Hotel Intercontinental hotel room. 60 years, 645,000, many failures. We can imagine a lot of hotels put in the wrong spot. A lot of failures. But it is not the largest bed-sharing company in the world. The largest bed-sharing is couch surfing. Couch surfing is where I put my excess capacity of my couch or my guest bedroom onto a common platform called couch surfing. And in nine years, it's 1.2 million beds in 237 countries, of which they are not. So if we can compare that, just look at the scale and speed of what is going on here. Instead of 60 years producing 645,000 rooms, nine years producing 1.2 million rooms. What's going on? This is, we see more and more of these types of things. And I'm just going through these quickly. Meetup is a company where you have an idea that you want to meet with people. And 7.2 members in 45,000 cities, 250,000 meetings a month. Etsy, I'm selling my stuff on a common platform, 1.5 million items in 150 countries. Waze, I contribute my traffic speeds, 2 million people using it in just a few years. Airbnb, another bed sharing type of idea, in three years, 1 million rentals in 160 countries. Carpooling.com, I'm sorry, this is not working out quite so well. Um, they have 2 million users every month. Carpooling, my excess capacity, putting my excess capacity of these trips onto a specific websites so people can find them. So as I look at it and evaluate what is happening, people are putting their excess capacity. And when you put excess capacity, it means that it is already bought, already bought, already paid for, already placed, already in position. I don't have to worry about what the ROI is. When I put my excess capacity onto a common platform, now it is, I can do online search and transactions very, very painlessly. I can find very specific things and pay for them in a very, very easy, costless way. 
I have a distributed network, incredibly flexible, incredibly resilient and re redundant. If we think of hotels, when your hotel flight, uh, you, when you put it in the wrong spot or there was a hurricane, you've completely lost out with these distributed networks. No one point is taking, taking you down. And they're created by the community themselves. So when we use excess capacity, we can have the possibility of innovation and experimentation because we've dramatically reduced the financial risk. So taking this back to, let me just go back one more slide. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this for transportation networks. How is it possible? How can we take the advantage of this surge in what is happening with with individuals putting their excess capacity onto common platforms. Carpooling.com, which is the, an example, and there's another very large one in France, is an example of ride sharing, which we know in the transportation sector has been a long, long dream. Why can't we make it work? It'll never work. It takes forever to work. In the places where it does work, it is remarkably incredible. My friend who runs the one in France, he has 35,000 trips every day happening. And he has this nice number that is each day he replaces 635 TGV trains. So 635 trains full of people are now being, you are now being, those people are being transported by ride sharing, existing cars going on trips already. So it is an amazingly remarkable source for us that's cheaper, doesn't take the infrastructure build because the infrastructure is already built out. So what am I doing now? I'm putting my uh, efforts where my belief system lies. So I've just recently founded this company, Buzzcar, in France, which is taking the excess capacity of individuals, corporate fleets, and government fleets, putting that availability onto a common platform where the company is providing the car sharing services. So this Buzzcar does the um, insurance, the technology, the 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 search functions, the reservations, the payment transactions, and the owners of these vehicles just have to own them, maintain them, and park them. And which the idea would be that we can grow at a much higher place at a cheaper cost. So we're using our cars that we're sharing on this common technology platform, which we use a website and smartphone apps. And so who are these driving, who are these members? They are every kind of person. They are like us. I love seeing these photos because it reminds me that there's real people doing real things. So we have a lot of them. And uh, going again to what are the benefits to using other people's cars for the fleets? One of the benefits is that I can compare it, let's say, to Autolib, which has famously come to Paris, about to come to Paris. Instead of one kind of car that you can access throughout the city with Buzzcar, uh, we launched in June. You can use any kind of car because it's individuals' own cars. And uh, we have individuals are choosing their own insect and creating their own logo because this company is their company. And so each car has its own logo pair that they chose because they are getting the vast majority of the revenues and this is their company. So here we have uh, another woman in Nantes with her Renault a person with an Opel in Montreuil, uh, Vincent in Paris with his Ford Fiesta, in Lyon, um, an MG, my favorite picture of Selma in Valence. So each these cars are spread across Europe. They're different kinds of cars, different kinds of price points, different kinds of age, ages. And we have this, the power of this company is going to be its diversity. And that will be how we will succeed because we have a diversity of Potential, potential and geography. So to show to you how it has played out, uh, this is in four months we've been live, and now we have created a fleet of cars available by the hour in just four months, a 1,000 cars with 3,000 people signed up. I didn't have to pay for any of those cars, and here you can see across France that they're um, widely available. And so coming back to where I was starting, Buzzcar is collaboratively built infrastructure that was collaboratively financed. And we can do this with speed and scale if I can get lots of other things working correctly. It's non-trivial. But once we get it all together, it can happen at a different pace, just as we saw with couch surfing, having 1.2 million rooms after nine years. My hope is that we can bring car sharing and the benefits of car sharing around the world very rapidly. 
Thank you.